Grace and peace to you. Do not try any of those at home. That was entitled Famous Last Words. That means that was the last words they said before they died. All right? Famous last words. Do not try any of that at home. Uh, welcome. We're glad you're here. I'm Pastor Tony. And today our scripture comes to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul is writing to the church of Corinth and I invite you to read with me. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So the word of God for you, for me, for all people, and to that we say, thanks be to God. So I follow you on Facebook as you follow me, many of you, and uh, I couldn't resist this story that I read last night. One of the grandmothers here took her five-year-old, five or six-year-old grandson to, um, to get an x-ray. Smashed his hand, hand is all bruised and can't move his fingers, so takes him to get the x-ray, and the little boy gets, is, they're in the parking lot, and the little boy refuses to get out of the car, screaming, I don't want to have an x-ray, I don't want to have an x-ray, and she's like, it's going to be okay, it's not going to hurt, no, no, I don't want to have an x-ray, I don't want to have, I don't want to have an x-ray, and so this goes on for a while, and so finally she asks, well, why don't you want to get an x-ray? Because mommy will know what I've eaten. <laughs> so after, uh, after she assured him that mommy would not find out what he had eaten, he got the x-ray. But later he did confess that he had eaten a button. And uh, that was, he'd had a button somewhere along the way. So uh, it, it, it's interesting the mindset that, that we have. Um, I remember uh, another, another friend of mine would... Uh, when, when she got out the vacuum, the vacuum, the floors of the kids, uh, she would always say, now this vacuum sucks up everything. So uh, they would scramble to put their toys away. So whenever they wanted to put their toys away, she just got out the vacuum and they cleaned the rooms. So I don't know, try that sometime. But of course you have to threaten them by saying the toys are all going to be gone. Um, would it be interesting if there was an x-ray that uh, really would discover about who we are inside of us. What was our motivation? What was our attitude? That the x-ray would reveal everything. There's actually a, a Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me into the way everlasting. So it's kind of like uh, putting yourself on the table and letting God use that vision, that x-ray, to see what is it inside of us that may be wicked so that we can correct the wickedness within us. Uh, Old Testament especially lays out these two different paths, the way of the wicked and the way of the righteous. Psalm 1, the, whole, the anchor for all the Psalms, 150 Psalms, Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is on the law of the Lord, and on the law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which produces fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so with the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the sinner shall perish. Say that last line with me and use a little emphasis on the word perish. But the way of the wicked shall perish. That's how I used to say it to my kids. They emphasize it. Um, now before we go too far in this, let's be very careful. Because we've already, we've already covered many times that one of the issues in the church of Corinth that Paul was addressing is spiritual arrogance. And many times what we do is we set up these, these two different groups of people. The people who live the way of the righteous and the people who live the way of the wicked. And so those of us who choose the way of the righteous, we tend towards spiritual arrogance. I mean, it's very common in the church today. 
There are, there are churches, there are folks in churches, there are folks in our church probably, maybe it's me, who have this spiritual arrogance. But we want to be very careful that because we're following the way that we believe that we're supposed to follow, that we don't think of ourselves as better than somebody else. And, and that, that oftentimes we have this handout, oh, we don't want to hang around those wicked people. We want to stay away from those wicked people because those wicked people are wicked, so stay away from them. We have to be very careful because Psalm 1, although it describes two different ways, it is not really intended for us to separate into two different groups. That's God's, that's God's doing. In the end, God will separate the sheep from the goats, that kind of thing. We have to be very careful because we who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ have to confess that we have wickedness within us. And those who may not be following Jesus Christ, there's a lot of good moral people making good decisions. And so we have to be very careful not to say we're better than they are. That's not what this message is about. That's not the difference between the way of the rich, uh, righteous and the way of the wicked. What is before us is that there are two different ways to follow. And we're given an opportunity to follow the way of the righteous. And basically, Psalms and then Proverbs says the way of the righteous is basically making good decisions. And the way of the wicked is making bad decisions. And so Psalms and Proverbs steers us away from bad decisions towards good decisions. And some of these Proverbs that were collected by Solomon and put into uh, Holy Scripture, not all of those Proverbs originated in the Jewish faith or the Christian faith. He collected wisdom from the area of the time of uh, where he lived in the in 10th century B.C. because there's because truth is truth, whether it's, whether it's um, spoken by a Christian or spoken by a non-Christian. A good decision by a non-Christian is a good decision by a Christian. So we have to be very careful. So, so Psalms and Proverbs points us to make good decisions and tries to prevent us from making bad decisions or self-destructive decisions. Decisions that destroy our minds, our bodies, our will, our emotion, and not just us, but destroys relationships. So when we ha come to this whole piece about the way of the wicked, we're looking at the way, uh, an example not to follow. And when you look at the way of the righteous, we're looking at an example to follow. So we put that Old Testament piece together, and what comes to uh, first century, Jesus comes along, and he says, I am the way. Now, that is a common theme in Scripture. So everyone that heard these words, the way, they're connecting them to the way of the righteous versus the way of the wicked. So when Jesus says, I am the way, he's not just saying, go down this path. He's saying, I am the example to follow. If you want to live a righteous life, follow my example. So when Jesus offers you the invitation, follow me, we have a choice. But accepting the, the invitation of Jesus to follow Jesus is accepting a relationship. And it's accepting a relationship to say, I will follow you to be like you. What we're saying is, I'm going to follow the example of Jesus. And when we agree to do that, then we become a disciple of Jesus. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we as disciples are following the way of Jesus we're trying to make good decisions. We're trying to make the right decisions. We're trying to have compassion as Jesus had. We're trying to be motivated by love as Jesus was motivated by love. And that motivation of love that Jesus had for you and me uh, sent him to die on a cross. So his action was motivated by love to die on the cross for your sins and for mine and to be raised to life on the third day that gives us hope for eternal life. So we have these two different ways, and those of us who choose to follow Jesus, we also have to be careful, because within us, there is still that evil within us. There is still that tendency to make bad decisions. We don't have some magic wand, and all of a sudden, all our decisions are perfect. We have to continue to try to live as Jesus taught us to live. And, there, and there's a lot of folks in, in the category where, 
where they may not necessarily believe that Jesus was the Son of God, some spiritual being where Jesus was equal to God, but they come across the teachings of Jesus, and they come across the compassion, they come across the love, and they're inspired by that, and they begin to follow the example of Christ as well. Um, so so there, there are sometimes when the church and the secular world are miles apart, but there are sometimes the church and the secular world can agree on many things. So we come to this whole idea. So we, I'm going to put that, I'll come back to all that in just a little bit. But the scripture today talks about that you are the temple of God. Now what we read today... Uh, there are two ways of looking at this. You are the temple of God. One way is that you as an individual, your person, your body, is the temple of God. But that's not what 1 Corinthians 3 is referring to. 1 Corinthians 3 is a different concept where it says, y'all are the temple of God. Say y'all with me. Y'all. Y'all are the temple of God. You, got, you sound like you're from southern Indiana. Y'all are from the temple of God. Y'all are part of the temple of God. So it's collectively, when we are together as the body of Christ, we are the temple of God. And that is also accentuated in the Apostle Peter when he writes that you are living stones, and the stones are built up to form the temple of God. And the concept is, as the temple of God, the Holy Spirit lives in us. Now, there's also the concept in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 where it is singular. The Holy Spirit lives in you, one person. The Holy Spirit lives in me. So they both exist at the same time. The Holy Spirit lives in me, but more often than not, it's the Holy Spirit lives in us. So you have this concept of, so, so when we say, if you get up this morning and say, hey, I'm going to church, uh, I would probably have a theological conversation to say, no, you're not going to church. You can't go to church. If you're a Christian, you are the church. The church is not a building. The church is wherever the Spirit of God rests. And when the Spirit of God rests in us, we are the church. So the church is a people. The church is not a building. You guys know that, right? Well, <laughs> now you do. <laughs> now you do. All right. So uh, let's go back. Let's, let's bring that from Old Testament to New Testament. Let's bring that to this idea of the temple. A thousand years before Christ, every little community, every little town, every country had its own god or gods. So if, if I lived in, a, in the town, so let's just say I lived in Georgetown, and all the Georgetown people got together and we said, we need to build, we need to build a temple for our god. Well, first let's adopt a god. Okay, we'll adopt that god. That's going to be our god. So we're going to adopt that God. Well, how can we get that God to be with us? Well, we need to build a house for the God. So we build a house for the God. We cry out to that God. The God comes and lives in our temple. Now, the reason we want a God in our town is because we want our God to protect us and we want our God to provide for us. And so when, the, when it's time to plant the crops, we pray to our, our God for a fertile crop. When we want to have babies, we pray to God so we can have babies. So it's a God of fertility, a God of protection, a God of provision. And then it uh, developed in, in uh, Baal, B-A-A-L, say Baal. All right, Baal is like the, the evil God that the Jewish people or Israel was fighting against. It was the God of north, the God of the, the uh, Syrians. And so that was a little bit different. And I'm, I'm sharing this with you if you read your Bibles and you're like, what in the world is Baal? What in the world is an Asherah pole? Anybody ever wonder what an Asherah pole was? No, I didn't think so. All right, so here's the idea. So uh, we say, okay, we're going to invite Baal to be our God. So we build a temple for Baal. Well, Baal is in this city, in this temple. That's where Baal lives. So this city, 50 miles away, they want Baal to come over to their city and they want, to, want Baal to bless their crops and bless their people and protect them. They wouldn't build a temple for Baal. They would build an Asherah pole. You know what an Asherah pole represents? A female goddess. So that male might be lured by the beautiful female goddess that we worship. And then Baal would come and, and fertilize our plants and bless our people and have all that stuff. So, all this, so, so if you're in a town, you'd put your Asherah pole in the highest place in town. So all over Assyria at the time, all over the northern kingdom above Israel, you have Baal and all the Asherah poles, and you had this 
this connected worship, worship that went on for centuries. And so when the psalmist says, I lift mine eyes to the hills, where does my help come from? What he's doing is he's lifting his eyes and he's seeing all the Asherah poles on top of all the hills. And he's saying, where does my help come from? Does it come from that God? Does it come from that temple? Does it come from that Asherah pole? No, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. But the Israelites, they built their own temple. And that's where their God was. Their God was Yahweh. And from an outside perspective, it doesn't look like they're any different than any other culture of the time. And so they built a temple, Solomon built a temple, and they put the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was the footstool of God. So God's feet was in the temple. So if you wanted to be close to God, or if you wanted to pray, you would look towards Jerusalem. No matter where you were, you'd look towards Jerusalem because that's where God was. And if you wanted to worship, you'd you'd take and you'd go to uh, Jerusalem and you'd go to the temple because that's where God was. So the people of Israel were in fits when they went into Babylonian captivity. For 40 years, they were sent out of Israel and they were, they were dejected, they were miserable, they felt like God had abandoned them, they felt like they weren't a part of where God was because God was back in Jerusalem. So the prophet Ezekiel, that's the prophet that has the wheel within the wheel, the prophet Ezekiel has this vision, and the vision is that God leaves Jerusalem and comes and rests on the people. So the concept of God being with the people was being developed. And so first century comes along, Jesus comes along, John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and in 114 he says, and the Word dwelt among them, dwelt among the people. Jesus was with us. And so Jesus lived and breathed and taught, became our example. And then in John 16, he says to the disciples, Hey, I'm going away, but I'm not going to abandon you. I'm going to send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will rest upon you and reside in you and with you. So, the, so it began, it continued to develop that the Holy Spirit was with us. So when Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, You all are the temple of the Holy God, because the Holy Spirit lives in you all, lives in us. And so he says, what we just read was, don't destroy the temple. So we have things like gossip destroys the temple, slander, violence, murder, lying, cheating, stealing, all these things help destroy the temple, because it destroys relationships, it destroys who we are. So you have that whole concept as refrain from doing any self-destructive behavior, refrain from doing anything that destroys the people of God, the Holy Spirit, resides in the church. But then you, you move on and you get to, um, you get to chapter 6. Paul has changed themes just a little bit, but the resisting self-destructive behavior still exists. But now it's on an individual basis. So, so there are a lot of lists in Scripture, things not to do. Uh, Galatians, you, you're probably familiar with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience. That follows a whole other different list of things we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to slander, gossip, all those kinds of things. So there are a lot of, lot of lists of what we're not to do, the way of the wicked. And there's a lot of lists of what we are to do, the way of the righteous. So we're constantly, one of the things in Scripture, we're constantly looking at how are we to live like Jesus and ask that question and strive towards that. Now, I, I put some of those sayings in the list there. Some of them are self-destructive behavior that we are actually battling today in our society. Some of them are self-destructive behavior that hurts the church that we battle today in every church. Um, they're not that much different than first century as it is to 21st century. The concepts are the same. Don't do, if I can go back to the video, don't do anything stupid. That's basically what it says. That's a whole, a whole proverbs in a sentence. Don't do anything stupid. Don't do stupid stuff. Don't do stuff that's going to hurt you. Don't do stuff that's going to hurt somebody else. Don't do something that's going to lead to someone else being hurt. Don't do stupid stuff. Do good stuff. 
And this is where the church and the world often can agree. Because you have things that emerge in our society that urges people to make the right choice. You, of course, the, the church has been doing that. Jesus says, you're the salt and you're the light. We're to influence the world to make good choices. And the one way we do that is we make good choices. We try to be like Jesus. Another way is to understand when we, look at, when we open up uh, to God and say, God, search me and know me, self-inventory. God, what is it in me that's wicked? And, and so we're, we're all honest and open about that. We're vulnerable with God, and we admit to others that we make mistakes. So we might be saying we're trying to be like Jesus, but we still do some stupid stuff, all right? Give you an example of how the world is trying to influence its own culture to make the right choices. There's an organization known by the initials, M-A-D-D. Ever heard of that one? Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. All right, what are we trying to do? We're trying to make sure that some dummy doesn't make a dumb decision, who's had too much alcohol, gets in a car, and drives down the road, potentially killing himself, herself, or somebody else. That's basic stuff. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says, don't get drunk. Don't get drunk. That's what the Bible says. Drunkenness is a sin. So the whole basis for that is, as a Christian, we are not to be under the influence of alcohol. That's the, that's the real key in that. Because we are to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit of God. And so when we drink too much, we think, according to alcohol, we begin to make decisions according to alcohol. Our motives are influenced by alcohol. Our attitudes are influenced by alcohol. You know, you know these great commercials. Millions of dollars goes into this. Some, sometimes just one commercial. You know, I've, I've never seen an alcohol commercial that shows the person with a hangover the next day. They're always happy, aren't they? They're always, I mean, they're at a campfire you know, great outdoors, or, you know, they get the girl, or the girl gets the guy, you know, or, the, or whatever's going on, there's something good happening in every 30-second beer commercial. What happens after the 30 seconds? They make stupid decisions. Not always, but sometimes they do. So they don't show those commercials, because we know the United States keeps great statistics, on average... 27 lives are lost every day because someone made a dumb decision to get behind a wheel and drive down a road and somebody dies because of it. 27 every day. So the church has been saying for years, don't make dumb decisions. The world says don't make dumb decisions. We can agree on that. You know, what? one of the, one of the biggest arguments I get from people Who's, who want to do their own thing, who want to drink or do drugs or whatever it is they want to do. Most, the most common excuse I get is, hey, it's my own business. What I do doesn't hurt anybody else. doesn't hurt anybody else. You mind your own business. Tell that to Laura. Laura heard the message this morning. As she left, she said, my, my brother was killed by a drunk driver 30 years ago. He was 17 years old. He was training. He was on a bicycle. He was training for a race. And a drunk driver hit him and killed him. Don't tell me your decisions don't hurt anybody else. They do. Your bad choices don't just hurt you. They hurt the people you love and sometimes hurt the people that you don't even know. And people are in pain for years. There's a loved one that's lost. This week, uh, occasionally I have, I have a friend I have breakfast with, I don't know, every other month or so. And so we've, we have breakfast, we get together and you know, he talks about his kids. He's a new grandpa. I talk about my kids and the great things they're doing. It's almost always a pretty happy conversation. And we're, 
having our eggs and bacon and, I don't know, maybe eating bacon's a self-destructive choice by itself. But we're eating our eggs and bacon, and he, he says to me, he says, uh, you, know, you know what today is? Well, I, I knew the date, I knew the day of the week, and I knew what I had. It wasn't necessarily an important day to me or anything I could think of on the calendar. I'm like, okay, it's, man, it's breast awareness month, it's uh, cancer awareness, is it um, baby day? You know, I'm trying to think of all the special days, and I couldn't think of anything. I said, help me out, what's, what's the day? Today's my son's birthday. And of course, we both began to form tears in our eyes because his son was such a, such a lovely guy, so, such full of life. He, he uh, was in his 20s. He went to college for a little bit, wasn't for him, got a good job, was able to pay his bills, had his apartment. He just bought a new truck. He'd gone down to uh, Florida and spent some vacation time with his, with his grandparents and celebrated his birthday last year with his grandparents in Florida. When he came home, he, he got with his friends. He wanted to celebrate his birthday with his friends. And so they, they went out, and they drank a little bit, and somebody, I guess, had, uh, had some other drugs that they thought, oh, this would be fun. It, it won't hurt anybody. Well, it's a special occasion. We'll just take a, take a few of these, and we'll all have a good time. As he was leaving to go with his friends, he turned to his grandpa and said, I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. He says, I'll beat you to work. He worked with his grandpa. He says, I'll beat you to work. He never beat his grandpa to work. His grandpa gets up at 6 in the morning. He's at work at 7. He never, he never even saw 7 o'clock in the morning before. So 8 o'clock comes, 9 o'clock comes the next day, and he didn't show up for work, and they did a you know, well check. You know, worried about him, wasn't answering his phone, wasn't answering text. It wasn't like him. I mean, he was, he was married to his phone. He, never, he was never apart from his phone. So either his phone was destroyed or something else. And so they went to his apartment and they found him in his bed. He had died that night. Whatever he had been doing, there was a, an, a drug that whether he knew it was in the other stuff or not, I don't know, but it's a drug called fentanyl. It's in the news. You may not have recognized it, but I tell you what, when your loved one dies of fentanyl, you, 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 know, you know it, and, and you see it, and you see it every day, and it's on the news all the time, and it's deadly. I just talked to a pharmacist this week, and I asked him about fentanyl, and uh, she immediately was like, just a, just a few grains of this is deadly, and, and these, these people are, are taking these fentanyl patches and breaking them up and putting them in alcohol and drugs and other things to, to enhance the, the high that they're getting. It's 100 times more potent than cocaine. 100 times more potent than morphine. And three little grains, same size as three grains of sugar, will kill you. It doesn't hurt anybody else, does it? No. No, it just destroys everybody. And I don't think this young man was expecting to die that night. And it was just one decision. And I know some of us here are making those dumb decisions. Or some of us know others that are making those dumb decisions. And if you can't change their minds, at least try. At least try. Now from the whole theological piece, we say we are the temples of God. And so we need to make good decisions about our bodies and about our relationships. Quit doing stupid stuff. And I know you get into that 14, 18, 20-year-old range and you start thinking you're pretty invincible. And you start taking risks. That's kind of a natural progression. 
But don't do something so stupid that you're not going to live to the age of 23 or 26. Because it does affect everybody that loves you. So I don't know who you know or what you're doing or what you know. But here's how I want to kind of look at today. There is the way of the righteous making good decisions. And even those of us that have chosen that way, we're not immune from making some dumb choices. But there are those who are, I'll just say, reckless. Reckless behavior. They're making bad choices. And maybe they're not making them every day. Maybe it's every week or maybe once a month or maybe that first reckless choice they make will be their last. But I'd like for you to pray in a couple of ways. One, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's the first part. And then we're called to be salt and light in our communities and in our world. So the next part of your prayer might be, Lord, help me to make a difference in the world today. Help me to save a life. Help me to intervene in the life of my friend or my child or my parent or my brother or my sister. And give me the wisdom to say what I need to say to change a life. And then there's one other area to pray. Maybe you're in a situation where this message was very painful because you've lost a loved one from a decision that he or she made or a decision somebody else made that took your loved one's life. Pray for forgiveness. Pray for healing. Pray for restoration. Let us pray. Most holy God, we come to you not as the innocent, but as the guilty.